net operating loss credits are the right way to go, but instead you limit who it, um, they apply to. And so you can really concentrate it into that early development work. Um, I think by having this process, what we'll do is allow for people to really ask some thoughtful questions. And my goal, and I think is shared by the co-chair, is um, just to make sure that we hear a variety of perspectives and take advantage of the incredible you know, experience that some of these individuals will bring to that conversation and, and give everybody a chance to really understand what's going on. Uh, and relative to the, the second part of your question, uh, Becky, um, you know, my, my view personally is if it were affordable, now the, under, I underline and italicize if, uh, I believe we should retire what's owed. That is, we should pay what's owed. I think we're obligated to do that. I think it creates confidence in a sovereign. Um, the difficulty is because of inaction by the previous legislature, and I think you're going to see a very different uh, modus operandi from, from this majority, uh, we've put ourselves in a, in a heck of a box where we have $3.5 billion in the CBR, and if we were to pay down what's owed, we'd have $2.5 billion in the CBR. Um, this, this is a real problem. Um, I, you know, I would like to see more than the statutory minimum paid on those credits. I personally, I'm not necessarily speaking for the majority, but I'm not trying to create a mortgage, a 30-year mortgage here. I don't, that's, that's bad planning, I think. Um, they are interest-free. Uh, folks were aware of the terms of these, uh, these credits, that they didn't have to be repurchased until there was development, for example. Um, and that they could be reduced to 10 or 15 percent depending on the price of a barrel. So um, I think that there's a way to reach some sort of settlement. I don't mean reduction necessarily. I mean some sort of settlement of this where um, all the stakeholders and both bodies can move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Steve Quinn with Bloomberg. I've got uh, two questions. One's open. The second is for the resource co-chairs. The first is when will we start seeing some details on your plan. By that I mean running the numbers to close the fiscal gap. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, that's a question that uh, this caucus is uh, formed around, and it's a, a question that, um, that uh, we're taking very seriously and uh, actually working on as we speak. It's a plan that um, will be coming through the Finance Committee and uh, we hope uh, very soon you'll, you'll begin to see the elements of that plan. Um, I think as we discussed last week, there are a lot of moving parts to putting a fiscal plan together that's uh, balanced, that's reasonable, that um, sort of requires all stakeholders at every interval of the economic uh, strata out there to shoulder the burden. And um, really when it comes down to it, it is about protecting the, the future of the state, the economy, jobs, and the central services that people receive out there. So we're, uh, we're focusing on it. Uh, it's uh, our top priority, and it's something that we're putting together and crafting uh, very carefully, and uh, again, hope to uh, have in the committee process very soon. And let me, add, let, me, let me add that uh, our focus is at protecting and growing the economy. And when we talk about a comprehensive plan, that means there's a lot of elements to it. And we want to make sure that we do it right because we want to make sure there's longevity in that. And so as we move forward, we're going to be um, listening to minority ideas as well because it's going to take everyone, uh, everyone's ideas to, to come up with something that uh, everybody can be proud of. And I, I want to thank the two co-chairs of resources for making their priority a minority priority, not necessarily a priority, but their first bill that they're going to hear, the minority bill, just to show that yes, we're going to listen to all good ideas in coming up with a fiscal plan. The second question is, um, resources co-chairs, what are your thoughts on AGDC opening an office in Japan? That seemed to catch the legislature off guard. My understanding is, you know, more than anything, it was sort of just a transition from a position that had previously be held, been held by an individual for three decades and that person retired when they went to rehire that person and had re that other individual had responsibilities in promoting Alaska fish as, for example as well um, and and they found someone who has more ex air, um, interest and expertise in the area of of gas um, natural gas sales and that that would be helpful um, you know we need to watch that 
as a, a an expense and and make sure that those are dollars that are well spent. I understand this individual has um, many decades at Mitsubishi, you know, a big player in in the energy market um, overseas there, where we are interested in doing business. If it helps this come to fruition, then you know we'll all say it was a good idea. Um, so I'll I'll be watching that and uh, and you know be critical if it's um, if it's something that doesn't seem like a good use of state resources at this time. So uh, Austin Baird from KTU, I guess two two quick questions um, for for anyone who wants it. Um, why, why do you think the state should continue spending on AKLNG right now? And uh, second, uh, strategically, uh, how do you find anything that could actually pass with oil and gas tax credit reform, given the way it went last year? Well, on the first part, do, do you want to go first? or? Well, sure. I mean, um, you know, uh, Austin, there's an argument that uh, if AKLNG were fully shelved, one might forget to take it off the shelf at the appropriate time. I mean, you know, what, what we're trying to and what the, the experts are trying to divine is where is the projected need a decade out? And, um, you know, we, we've, we, we, first of all, we've pared down what AGDC and AKLNG are spending and our, and our sort of gas team expenses. That's been really pared down. Um, they're not asking for any future appropriations. They're, they tell us, they've testified and, and told the press that they can get by with what they have. Um, the governor ran on this. Yes, there's reason to be uh, somewhat skeptical about whether this is, is going to happen in the near term. But you see, for example, that BP is willing to, to lend a hand and cooperate with both a tolling uh, regime and the other features. So. Um, you know, that's sort of my view on that question. Relative to other legislation, you know, HB 247 did get some things done, but we think that it's, continu it's important to continue to dialogue about the expenses associated with both the cashable and the against liability credits. And we think given, the, you know, there's discussion of restructuring dividends and using earnings reserve for the first time, that's an important component. Our caucus was partly, that was sort of one of the four pillars of our formation, was to look at these uh, tax credits and see whether um, they are sustainable and, and, and keep them where they are sustainable. So, you know, th the Senate will do what the Senate does, um, and we will do what we do, and hopefully some sort of uh, compromise can be reached. <clears throat> I would just add on AKLNG um, specifically, you know, that where the funds are coming from our previous appro appropriations left over from the 2015 special session when we bought out TransCanada, and then the um, remaining funds are from the standalone pipeline project um, funds that were capitalized about five or six years ago now. Those funds could be reappropriated um, to something else or, or put back to the general fund. Um, I think. The suggestion that it's, you know, we'll know in the very near term um, before the end of the calendar year whether there'll be a decision to move forward, that's probably as far out as I want to go. Um, that would be probably where we'll, you know, I think we really do, do need the information. Unfortunately, we have a circumstance where, again, um, the original four uh, partners spent about $500 million to get to this point. And so, you know, I think there is some question about if, you know, you've spent that much um, to get to this point, do you want to maximize that value, the value of that original investment? And I think us potentially completing this next year of work is how you do that um, before you get into the remaining billions. Um, Steve Butt used to say that it was, and I, I hope I'll get this right, it was $30 million um, a month before, and you know, when you go into feed, it's 30 million a week, and when you go into construction, it's 30 million a day. So you really want to get all your questions answered right now. You know, spend as little money as possible. Um, of course, we are representatives of the people. I know that the people I represent are um, questioning whether this is a good use of state funds, and if if it becomes clear that um, you know that the that people are uh, the people of Alaska are very against this, then you know it'll be our responsibility to respond to that. And and I think you know, we're sort of in that phase where we need to get additional information and soon 
um, that gives us a higher level of, of confidence that the project's going to go forward successfully. But there's no denying if it does happen, it will be the largest economic development project that the state and, and really right now that the world has seen. Um, thousands of jobs. And uh, as we look to our future and, and think about a fiscal plan and, and where um, the dollars will come from to, to support the services that we know are essential, this could be an important part of that. So I hope we can get, get answers soon. Um, Nat Hers with Alaska Dispatch News. I was curious for Representative Tuck, you, you were talking about the new uh, finance subcommittee process and you said it was going to be more, uh, I think, collaborative and transparent. Um, I'm just wondering, can you be specific about that? What what specifically makes this new process more transparent? I don't think it, you know we've had a, uh, much of a chance to actually see sort of what the plans are for how those committees will operate. Yes, and I'll use resources as the example. We have... Uh, uh, Seven hundred million dollars in in uh, tax credit liability. These these cash payouts to the industry, these subsidies that need to be addressed. And one of the best ways to address it is looking at it policy wise. Also, so we're combining the budget process with the policy committee, so that we can make the decisions not just for this year what's in our budget, but in future years on how we address the situation. So. One of the things that we've had in the past with all these different budget subcommittees all working around the building is we weren't on record on that. I mean, we, we had recordings and stuff. There wasn't anything being transcribed. But it's very difficult for the public to be able to know what's happening. And a lot of those committees are happening simultaneously with other committees from 7 a.m. in the morning till 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And I don't think that's very fair to the public. So this way, we're combining it together, making it more efficient. The public can, can uh, stay involved. And then... Um, anyone who wants to participate because they have the freedom to be able to do that because they're not burdened with all these other budget subcommittees can attend and be part of the process. Will the, will the proposed the actual sort of the, the changes to the budget and the, the actual sort of budget proposal from the subcommittee, presumably from the chair, the initial version, is that, is that going to be drafted or created any differently than it has been in the past based on the shared process? No. The, uh, so the, the, the budget subcommittee chair, who is going to be part of the policy committee, will do the same process. They'll take uh, recommendations um, from members, and then those recommendations go on to the full finance committee for consideration. I think it's also important to note that the amendment process in the full finance committee will be the same as it's always been. So majority members, minority members, uh, members who aren't on the finance committee, can offer amendments that will be considered just as they have uh, before and that the underlying the, the committee of jurisdiction the, the, po the policy subject matter experts uh, really sort of get the first crack at it uh, in an advisory manner and as the majority leader alluded uh, this will be done uh, during the day when the cameras are on the public uh, hopefully is uh, present and able to interact and then all leading towards a more careful consideration um, at the finance committee in an era where we're looking at uh, uh, and scrutinizing agency budgets uh, even more so than we've done in the past several years um, and looking at uh, uh, downsizing government in a real careful way. Yes, and I would uh, d direct your attention to uh, the co-chairs of finance for that. Elwood Bramer with the Alaska Journal of Commerce. Um, probably one more for the um, resource chairs. How much weight do you put behind BP's agreement with AGDC? I mean, it, 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 if you're for the project, it's probably a good thing to, to have mm -hmm. one of the producers saying they're willing to work, but it sounds like the state's still spending the money mm -hmm. and there's a lot to be worked out there yet. Um, when I 